In this video, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about lung cancer. This is, an, this is an incredibly high yield and important topic that shows up all the time. So my goal in this video is to have a reductionist approach, simplify this, tell you only what you need to know and nothing more, explain confusing topics that trip medical students up all the time, and then pepper in some pretty sweet mnemonics. So let's get started. Now, when it comes to lung cancer, you don't really need to conceptualize this and break it down into different categories, but I know that generally speaking, we're all a little OCD. So if this will help, the way that I think you should think of lung cancers is two big categories. And we're gonna use the same categories that the World Health Organization uses because it just makes the most sense. On the left, we'll talk about large neuroendocrine lung cancers. And on the right, we'll talk about non-small cell lung cancers. There are other ways to categorize lung cancers, but to be clear for the purposes of USMLE or COMLEX, this really doesn't matter at all. I'm just putting this here for completeness sake and for those of you who are a bit neurotic like me. So the cancers that we're gonna talk about in this video are what you see on this slide. In the large neuroendocrine category, we'll talk about small cell carcinoma and bronchial carcinoid tumors. And then in the non-small cell category, we'll talk about squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and large cell carcinoma. Just a brief overview on lung cancer and why it shows up on exams all the time. This is the leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide, and perhaps, obviously, this is due to smoking. It's the second most common cancer in both men and women. So because it's such a public health concern, obviously test writers are going to put this into exams all the time because not only is this does this topic have a lot of little nitty-gritty details they can test you on, but there's actually a public health concern and therefore this will be really clinically relevant once you're in residency and beyond. Now historically lung cancer has affected males more than females, typically around age 70, but this has changed somewhat in recent times. Let's get started by just going through and talking about these cancers one at a time. We'll start with small cell carcinoma, but as you can see on this slide, we're gonna pay special attention to the location of the tumor, the histopathology that you need to memorize, and, all, and then all of those high yield associations that will show up and be very buzzwordy on exams. So for small cell carcinoma, this is centrally located. And the big histopathology that you wanna look for is Kolchitsky cells. And this is what Kolchitsky cells look like. They're small, dark blue neuroendocrine cells that at least in the lung tumors, specifically in this case, small cell carcinoma, will lie close to the bronchi and the bronchiolar basement membranes. So if you're taking your exam, you know it has something to do with lung cancer because of the presentation in the vignette, and you see these really dark purple cells, those are Kolchitsky cells. Those are neuroendocrine cells. But without a doubt, the highest yield part of small cell carcinoma and the most important thing for you to memorize are the high yield associations. Again, all of these different lung cancers have high yield associations, they have expressed tumor markers, they have associated mutations, and they have clinical syndromes that you wanna look for. And this stuff gets tested the most out of any single item in this entire video. So when it comes to small cell carcinoma, you wanna know that it's highly associated with smoking and that if you're taking your test and you get a question and the question explicitly tells you that the person is a non-smoker, you probably want to think about a different type of lung cancer because small cell carcinoma is just so strongly associated with smoking. So that's actually very telltale in the clinical vignette. Now you also want to be on the lookout for chromogranin A. Now this is a tumor marker that gets expressed by small cell carcinoma. This is a secretory protein that you want to associate with different types of neuroendocrine cells. And recall from a few slides ago, I showed you that the small cell carcinoma has those Kolchitsky cells, which are neuroendocrine. So this is a really useful biomarker and shows up in exams in the vignette. If they tell you that an unknown lung cancer is expressing chromogranin A, you want to think perhaps small cell carcinoma. The other high yield association is the L-MYC oncogene, okay? So this is actually a mutation in a proto-oncogene that leads to or contributes to the formation of small cell carcinoma. So if they give you L-MYC oncogene as far as a proto-oncogenic mutation, 
think small cell carcinoma. But without question, the highest yield part of small cell carcinoma and being able to identify it on exams like USMLE and COMLEX is being able to spot when they give you a paroneoplastic syndrome. A paroneoplastic syndrome is basically a clinical syndrome, and you see some examples below, that's due to an incorrect immune response to the cancer. And the immune response to the cancer inadvertently causes something that's functionally identical to one of these syndromes, like SIADH, Cushing, Cushing syndrome, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome. And you really can't differentiate them from their native syndromes. In other words, you don't know if it's due to cancer or if it's due to like in the case of SIADH, a problem with ADH at the collecting tubule because functionally they're pretty much the same. So if you're taking an exam, you wanna be on the lookout for these three syndromes. Again, we're talking about SIADH, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. So if you're taking an exam and uh, they give you a lab printout and you see hyponatremia, but you see that in the backdrop of other symptoms that look like lung cancer, you know, coughing up blood, etc., you want to think, oh, they're giving me a paroneoplastic syndrome. They're giving me SIADH and pairing it with the cancer. Therefore, the cancer is probably small cell carcinoma. Likewise, they could give you Cushing syndrome. So this is hypercortisolism, and you should be very familiar with Cushing syndrome. So if you see clinical symptoms of Cushing syndrome, but that's in the backdrop of somebody that's a smoker, that's coughing up blood, right? They're giving you the lung cancer component with the symptoms of Cushing syndrome. They're giving you paroneoplastic syndrome. And then lastly, you can see Lambert-Eaton, excuse me, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, which is due to antibodies against presynaptic voltage-gated calcium channels, and those are specifically located in the neuromuscular junction. Now recall that this syndrome will create muscle weakness, but that muscle weakness will get better with more use of the muscle. All right, so if you see those symptoms and you see that in a smoker who's coughing up blood, who might have lung cancer, you wanna think, oh, it's a paroneoplastic syndrome, it's Lambert-Eaton syndrome, therefore the answer is small cell carcinoma. So as you can see, this is kind of tricky because test writers love to give you a question that kind of sounds like they're going after one of these syndromes Maybe you think, oh, they're asking me about SIADH. Oh, they're asking me about hypercortisolism. Oh, they're asking me about some type of neuromuscular problem. And then all of a sudden they're asking you for where else would you find pathology or what might the expressed tumor marker be? And this is really a prime opportunity for the test writer to ask you a third order question that's really challenging. So if you've seen my high yield video question bank series, you know that I preach being able to answer third order questions by making these connections and neural networks in your brain. I.e., you wanna be able to think that when you get a question about SIADH, there's a chance they could ask you about small cell carcinoma in the lung so that you're not blindsided when you get a lab printout, it shows you hyponatremia, and then they ask you for histopathology in the lung and you're like, what? SIADH in the lung? What is this? So you just don't wanna be caught off guard. And that's why this connection in your brain is really important. So when it comes to small cell carcinoma, how do you memorize this, right? What's the dirty mnemonic that you can use? Well, my, my method here is that when you think small cell carcinoma, you want to think SCL, small cell lung. After all, the way that this is you know, commonly referred to is small cell lung cancer, so SCL. And SCL is a really useful mnemonic because it tells us two things. One, it tells us that this is associated with smoking, chromogranin A, and LMIC oncogen, oncogene mutation. But we can also use small cell lung SCL to memorize the different paraneoplastic syndromes. S for SIADH, C for Cushing syndrome, and L for Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So small cell lung cancer, SCL, tells us what we should associate this with, and it also tells us the paraneoplastic syndrome. So this is just a beautiful mnemonic, so use it well. So that's small cell carcinoma of the lung, one of the more complex lung cancers, but really honestly, if you're gonna take one thing out of this video, just know the paraneoplastic syndromes and you'll be in good shape. Now let's talk about bronchial carcinoid tumor. So these can be central or peripheral, and test writers really aren't gonna ask you if it's central or peripheral. With small cell, maybe they'll want you to know it's central, but for bronchial, they're not gonna care. The histopathology here is that you'll see prominent rosettes, okay? You're gonna see prominent rosettes, 
in the bronchial carcinoid tumor. This is associated more, more so with children. It's also associated with chromogranin, but the biggie here really is the carcinoid syndrome that this bronchial carcinoid tumor will create. And what I wanna do is sort of just take a step back here and over explain probably what a carcinoid tumor is and how they function. Because there's a lot of confusion I've noticed with medical students in understanding carcinoid tumors, but also carcinoid syndromes. So if we take a step back and just speak really generally here, carcinoid tumors can exist in various different locations. Most of them are gonna be in the GI syndrome, but a very small percentage of them will actually be in the lungs. And that's the type that we're talking about, obviously in this video with bronchial carcinoid tumors. And these types of tumors, they all, regardless of where they're located, whether they're in the GI system, the lungs or anywhere else, they all share the common feature of being neuroendocrine tumors, which is to say that they're comprised of cells, neuroendocrine cells, that are active in producing neuroendocrine chemicals, right? Neuro in the neurologic system, endocrine in the endocrine system. So it shouldn't be surprising to you to hear that they produce serotonin, also known as 5-HT. And the effects of serotonin are what you see on this slide. It causes flushing, diarrhea, bronchospasm, diaphoresis, and GI upset. And if you have any trouble memorizing those uh, effects of serotonin, I just want you to think about what do you see in a patient who has serotonin syndrome? Well, you see these symptoms. And that should make sense to you because in someone that's got too much serotonin in their body, whether that serotonin is due to serotonin syndrome or whether that serotonin is due to the production of endogenous 5-HT by neuroendocrine cells in a carcinoid tumor, the effect is gonna be the same. And lastly, if you've gone through your psychiatry section in first aid already, you probably know that the side effects of your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs include the things you see on this slide. And that's because when we increase serotonin, regardless of if it's in a pill, if it's due to a neuroendocrine tumor, or if it's due to serotonin syndrome, the effects are flushing, diarrhea, bronchospasm, diaphoresis, and GI upset. So in a carcinoid tumor, it's neuroendocrine cells that contain these little teeny granules, and those granules will produce these neuroendocrine products, in this case, serotonin. Now I wanna explain the most complex part of carcinoid tumors, and that's carcinoid syndrome. Carcinoid syndrome is not going to be present in every single carcinoid tumor. And I just wanna take a minute to again, over explain this because I see this as a huge point of confusion in lots of different students. So here on this slide, you see a neuroendocrine cell. So that little black cell, I want you to pretend for a second that that's present in a carcinoid tumor. Now, because it's a neuroendocrine cell in a carcinoid tumor, it's going to have neurosecretory granules that will produce serotonin, okay? So 5-HT. And normally, that serotonin will be basically released into our circulation, specifically in the portal circulation, and it'll go up to the liver. And when it reaches the liver, the liver have, has an enzyme in it called monoamine oxidase. And for short, that's MAO. And what the role of monoamine oxidase is, is to basically break down that serotonin. It breaks down that 5-HT and it makes the breakdown product 5-HIAA. And I don't need you to worry about what that stands for, but just know that if you see 5-HIAA, that that's a breakdown product of serotonin. And then that 5-HIAA will get excreted out into the urine, okay? So this is what happens in normal circumstances, and this is what happens if you have a carcinoid tumor in the GI tract. Because even if you have a carcinoid tumor in the GI tract, it's going to secrete the serotonin, but that serotonin will go through the portal circulation and basically go through the metabolism by the MAO in the liver. Okay, so you don't get carcinoid syndrome if you have a GI carcinoid tumor because the liver is basically serving as a safety valve to break down all of the serotonin that the carcinoid tumor is creating. Now let's talk about what happens if you get metastasis of your carcinoid tumor. So now you see that, that neuroendocrine cell, that carcinoid tumor, now it's red and beefy because it's going to metastasize. And if it metastasizes specifically to the liver, then it can bypass the, me the metabolism of MAO in the liver. And what it's doing here is that serotonin is now being released 
on the liver because the carcinoid tumor has metastasized to the liver and that serotonin will be released directly into the hepatic vein and undergo hepatosystemic shunting. And in this case, because there's no MAO available to break down what's natively now being produced on the, the actual liver itself, then what you're going to get is that serotonin being released directly into the circulation, bypassing the breakdown in the liver. And at this point, we have full-blown full blown carcinoid syndrome. So you're going to get flushing, diaphoresis, all that stuff that we talked about on the previous slide. So big takeaway so far is that if you have a carcinoid tumor in the GI tract, you have nothing to worry about because the liver will break down any serotonin that gets to it. But if a carcinoid tumor metastasizes to the liver from the GI tract, now you're going to get carcinoid syndrome. Okay. Now we're obviously talking about lung cancer. So let's talk about what happens when carcinoid tumors occur in the lungs. Now, if that cell is occurring in the lungs, the lung also has monoamine oxidase in it. So basically, once anything gets to the lung, just like you saw in the liver in that example with the black arrows, so too will the lung break down any serotonin. But that's actually a problem for everything that happens before the lung. So if you're getting a carcinoid tumor that's secreting serotonin, and that serotonin is going through the right side of the heart before it gets to the lung, because that's the direction that blood flows, then you get something called carcinoid heart disease or right-sided carcinoid heart disease. And that clinical syndrome is composed of a few things. One, right-sided valvular fibrosis, two, tricuspid regurgitation, and three, pulmonary valve stenosis. And basically what you're seeing here is that there's increased deposition of collagen, which leads to all three of these uh, symptoms, but you don't see that on the left side because as the blood flows through the lungs, the monoamine oxidase in the lungs will break down the serotonin that's in the blood that was produced by the carcinoid tumor, just kind of like you saw with the monoamine oxidase in the liver in the first example. So this is a crazy over explanation of how different carcinoid syndromes will present or not present based on where the tumor is located. So obviously, again, we're talking about bronchial carcinoid tumors here, and you want to think about these obviously being located in the lung, and you can see extra intestinal serotonin secretion. So that is your bronchial carcinoid tumors. No good mnemonics here. Just memorize carcinoid syndromes and know to a greater extent the symptoms to look for and what location your carcinoid tumor will be in and whether or not that will have the full-blown manifestation of carcinoid syndrome. All right, now we're going to switch gears and talk about the non-small cell lung cancers, and we'll begin with squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is located centrally. The high-yield histopathology you want to know are that you're going to see keratin pearls and desmosomes. And specifically, as you see on this slide, Due to those desmosomes, you're going to see something called intercellular bridging. So if you see the buzzword intercellular bridging or you see the buzzword desmosomes, you want to stop, do not pass go, and pick squamous cell carcinoma. Now the highest yield thing to know about squamous cell carcinoma is that just like small cell carcinoma, it is also associated with a peroneoplastic syndrome. This one's a bit easier because there's really only one big peroneoplastic syndrome that squamous cell is associated with, and that one is called humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy. Sometime you'll see this written out as the shorthand as PTHRP. So PTHRP stands for parathyroid hormone-related peptide, and it has a function that's basically identical to endogenous parathyroid hormone. And in humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy, due to an incorrect immune response to the lung cancer, the body is incorrectly sensing the presence of parathyroid hormone. And it's really this parathyroid hormone-related peptide. Now, what does parathyroid hormone do? Well, to refresh your memory, recall that it is responsible for osteoclastic bone resorption. And that has a net effect in the body to basically increase calcium levels and decrease phosphate reabsorption. So when you get this humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy, it shouldn't surprise you that some of the clinical syndromes that you'll see 
are all of the symptoms that we classically associate with hypercalcemia, okay? And what are those symptoms? You're gonna see things like nephrolithiasis, so be on the lookout for the formation of calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate stones. You also wanna think about nonspecific GI complaints, so like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation, etc. You wanna think about musculoskeletal injuries and musculoskeletal complaints, so myalgia, arthralgia, nonspecific generalized bony pain. So all of these items, all of these clinical symptoms are evidence to you that the test writer is going after a hypercalcemic picture. And that hypercalcemia is due to the body having an aberrant immune response to the parathyroid hormone related peptide. Okay, and formally, that whole paraneoplastic syndrome is known as humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy. So it's very, very high yield. So needless to say, squamous cell carcinoma, if you're going to take one thing away from this video, it's that you want to know the specific paraneoplastic syndrome that I just talked about. And how do you memorize this? My mnemonic here is that when we think about squamous cell carcinoma, we want to really focus in on the letter Q because this is the only lung cancer with a Q in its name. So squamous equals hypercalcemia, keratin pearls, and cellular connections. And of course, when I'm saying cellular connections, I'm talking about those desmosomes and that intercellular bridging. So again, just to summarize, really hammer this into your brain, squamous has the Q in it. It's the only lung cancer with Q. Q for hypercalcemia, Queratin pearls and cellular connections. So again, desmosomes and intercellular bridging. That Q can really Q, no pun intended, Q your memory into the three things that you need to know. And that's it, guys. Really, really easy. Squamous cell carcinoma. Really know that paraneoplastic syndrome. And then if you're feeling fancy and you're shooting for that 290, keratin pearls and desmosomes. So that is squamous cell carcinoma. All right, so now let's move on and talk about adenocarcinoma of the lung. Adenocarcinoma of the lung is located peripherally, and the histopathology is that these are featuring mucin-producing cells. You should know by now that the prefix adeno means gland. So adenocarcinoma means cancer arising from glandular tissue, and therefore in glandular tissue, it should be no surprise to you that you're going to see mucin-producing cells, excuse me, mucin-producing cells that will stain positive for mucin. Now, the associations are what really are high yield for adenocarcinoma, and this is much more of an epidemiology thing than it is anything else. The big high yield points here is that adenocarcinoma is highly associated with women more so than men and non-smokers. And that non-smoking piece is really high yield because some of the other cancers that we've already talked about, like small cell lung cancer and squamous cell cancer, those are highly associated with smoking. But adenocarcinoma is the one that the test writer will go after if they don't give you a history of smoking or if they give you a female patient. So you wanna know adenocarcinoma, non-smoking female patients. Now, as far as the associated genetic mutations, you want to think about a few things here. The first is epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR. The next is anaplastic lymphoma kinase translocation, or ALK. And the last is CRAS, K-R-A-S, which is basically just a proto-oncogene. You don't need to know what these are or what they do, but just know that if you see them, the test writer is going after adenocarcinoma. One of the high yield associations that you do want to know pretty well is what's called hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. And this is probably a paraneoplastic syndrome associated with adenocarcinoma. And regardless of whether we give it the distinction of actually being a paraneoplastic syndrome or not, you just want to know this association. So hypertrophic osteoarthropathy is going to cause patients to have clubbing of their nails. And you can see what that looks like here on this slide. If you're answering a question on USMLE or Comlex and you have a patient who clearly has some lung problem with risk factors for lung cancer and a presentation of lung cancer, and they give you this image, they're, they're hinting heavily that this is adenocarcinoma due to this hypertrophic osteoarthropathy.
And what we think is going on here is that you get fibrovascular growth in the nail bed. And that's probably due to these things called megakaryocytes that, that go to the nail bed when they shouldn't. Normally they should be filtered out in the lung, but because the lung is undergoing the adenocarcinoma, i.e. the cancerous process, which is disrupting its normal physiology, these things that should be filtered out are not filtered out, and therefore these patients will have the accumulation of these substances and therefore some abnormal growth and proliferation in the nail bed. And the net result, and I'll go back to this image for just a second, is that if you are doing a physical exam and you palpate the nail bed, it's gonna feel soft, and, and some people describe it as sort of spongy and, and kind of waxy. So this is what you wanna, see, what you wanna keep an eye out for if you're taking your exam um, and the question gives you lung cancer because that's gonna be the association of hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. And now the last thing you want to know about lung adenocarcinoma is that adenocarcinoma has a relatively better prognosis than the other types of lung cancer that we have already talked about today. So if you see adenocarcinoma, it's somewhat atypical in the sense that it's peripheral, it occurs more in females, it occurs more in non-smokers, and it has a better prognosis. So like I said when I started the conversation about adenocarcinoma, this is more of an epidemiological kind of question. So pretty high yield, especially on step two and level two, but if they go after it on USMLE or COMLEX step one, level one, maybe they'll go in the direction of these atypical features. Now because these atypical features are what I believe is the highest yield part of learning adenocarcinoma, you need a mnemonic to help you remember that this is somewhat atypical. So when I think of adenocarcinoma, I think of adenoncarcinoma, which reminds me two things. One is that this is the cancer that occurs in non-smokers, so adenoncarcinoma in non-smokers. The other thing is that if I look at the letters N-O-N -N in non, not only does it tell me that this occurs in non-smokers, but N for non-smokers, O for osteoarthropathy, which again is that clubbing of the nail that's associated with this, and the last N is not a bad prognosis. So that kind of reminds me of the atypical features, but it also reminds me of that high yield association, which may or may not be a peroneoplastic syndrome. So that's adenocarcinoma of the lung. So here's where we are at this point. We've just got one more lung cancer to talk about, and that is large cell carcinoma of the lung. Luckily, large cell carcinoma of the lung is extremely straightforward, and the name of this lung cancer tells you really the only thing that you need to know. So the location is peripheral, and the classic histopathology is going to be anaplastic, undifferentiated, pleomorphic giant cells. And this is really the highest yield thing here. It's being able to recognize either in the image of the cancer or by the description or the buzzword pleomorphic giant cell that you're being shown or you're being led to the large cell carcinoma. So because the name is large cell carcinoma, clearly this cancer involves giant cells. So if you see the description, undifferentiated anaplastic pleomorphic giant cells, or you see this image, which has large undifferentiated anaplastic giant cells, you wanna be thinking about large cell carcinoma. Now, just a few other associations to top us off here. This is associated with smoking, and large cell carcinoma does have a pretty poor prognosis. And for whatever reason, test writers do sometimes incorporate this last fact here. It's that large cell carcinoma responds poorly to chemotherapy. So if you see that, you clearly wanna pick large cell carcinoma. But again, the most important thing about large cell carcinoma for USMLE and COMLEX is being able to recognize this image. So if you see those pleomorphic giant cells, if you see this slide, that's the classic histopathology and you wanna pick large cell carcinoma. So at this point, we've done all of these types of lung cancers and along the way, I've pointed out the very high yield bits of information that you should take away from this slide. If you're sort of approaching this topic like, dude, just tell me what I need to know and save me all the fluff. I don't have time for that. So for your studying pleasure, here is a summary table of these five different types of lung cancer. And what you see here is whether they are central or peripheral, their associations, and the mnemonic that I gave you. Remember that small cell lung, SCL, tells us 
not only the associations, but the perineoplastic syndromes. Squamous cell carcinoma is the only one with a Q in the name. So just remember that Q tells you a lot. And then for adenocarcinoma, think adenon carcinoma for non-smokers and then a few other things as well. The last mnemonic I want to add to this is that it's very important to understand that small cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma are your two big centrally located lung cancers. And the way to remember this is that small and squamous are central. But if you can memorize my very stupid mnemonic shown in red, as well as this last one here shown in blue, you're going to be in great shape to get all these questions correct. So I hope this was helpful to you and keep up the awesome work.